Okay. Yeah. A little bit of deja vu. I think I was the host for the last out of state in person speaker we had back in November. Um, hopefully it sticks this time. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Ahrens. She's um, an assistant professor at the um, Scripps Institute for Oceanography, um, uh, focusing on dust and the geochemistry, provenance, tracing, what it means. Um, she got her bachelor's at Stanford University and did her graduate work at the University of Michigan. Um, and with that, please go. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thanks everyone for coming uh, this morning. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the role of dust on Earth's climate. And I think in the description, I talked a little bit about um, insights from the paleoclimate record and also from modern ecosystems. Um, I'm gonna kind of give you a little bit of a taste of the work that we do with dust in modern ecosystems, but I'm mostly gonna be focusing on dust in the paleoclimate record. So I'm showing two different photos on this introduction slide. The first one on the left is Taylor Glacier in East Antarctica, where I'm gonna be showing you a climate record that spans uh, marine isotope stage six to marine isotope stage 5E, the last interglacial period. And then on the right-hand side is an image of a modern dust collector that we have set up on um, San Jacinto Peak in Southern California. So if any of you have been to Palm Springs and have seen that huge mountain that's right behind Palm Springs, it's that mountain that we're looking at. Uh, but before I get started, um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the funding sources um, that have made this work possible and uh, everyone who's helped out with field work, lab work, and data interpretation. So a lot of our work is um, very field work intensive. Um, we also do a lot of work in the lab. So uh, I have a, a kind of a collection of photos from my lab group um, currently in the field and then also in the lab. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge all the co-authors on the publications that came out of this work um, and my current collaborators. Um, which also include the Coldex team, which Duncan is a part of. Um, okay, all right. Oops. All right, so some of you may be wondering why I'm interested in dust. And so dust is a really big part of the type of research that we do in our, in our group. And um, hopefully by the end of this talk, you may or may not be convinced that dust is an important part of our climate system. Um, but this is a photo of a dust storm in Australia in 2009. And um, the first thing that I notice when I look at this photo is the size of the dust plume that's moving towards us in the photo, right? And the second thing that I notice is the color of the dust. And um, the color is deep red and that's because it contains a lot of oxidized iron within it. This particular dust storm was visible from space. So here's a satellite image of the same dust storm coming off of uh, the continent of Australia being uplifted and carried out over into the open ocean. Um, this particular dust plume, when it was deposited in the surface ocean, it resulted in a phytoplankton bloom that was visible from space. So phytoplankton draw down carbon dioxide, right? And so it's through this process that the rock cycle is related to the carbon cycle. Um, whenever I give a talk about dust. Um, I love to show this animation, um, number one, because it really beautifully illustrates uh, the role of different aerosols on Earth's surface, um, but it also shows the impact and the, the reach that dust actually has. So we're looking at three different types of aerosols. We're looking at smoke in uh, North America from wildfires. We're also looking at sea salt over the open oceans. And then finally, we have our largest source of dust. Uh, I'm just going to put my pointer on our largest source of dust in the Northern Hemisphere, which is the Sahara Desert. So uh, this isn't you know, a satellite image, it's a combination between satellite imagery and computer simulation, but you can see how the dust is uplifted off of that continent, carried over the Atlantic Ocean. Some of it is deposited in the surface ocean. Some of it makes its way to places like the Caribbean, the Southeastern United States, even the Amazon rainforest. So places that have been subjected to intense chemical weathering, where you have high temperatures, high humidity, a lot of leaching from soils, right? And so in these particular places, the impact of outside dust sources becomes really important when we start thinking about soil um, nutrient supply. 
So it's been shown that if we didn't have this constant input of Saharan dust in these places, um, we would have issues with nutrient availability in um, chemically leached soils. Some of this dust, uh, believe it or not, makes its way up to the polar regions. So there's been some work done in Greenland that has detected the presence of Saharan dust. Um, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on the Southern hemisphere for the ice core story, um, but I just like to show you know, this image um, because it kind of illustrates like how widespread dust actually is on, on Earth. Okay, a little bit more about the dust cycle on Earth. So when we think about dust, dust is basically fine grain particles of rock, right? So what are the sources of dust? Desert, deserts are a huge one, right? This is the place where you have a lot of particles that are available to be uplifted by wind and carried up into the upper atmosphere prior to transport. Uh, another place that um, provides a lot of fine grained sediment is actually the outwash areas of glaciers and ice sheets. So places where you have intense physical weathering, right? So places where um, you have an ice sheet that's basically grinding over bedrock, creating really, really fine grained particles. That's another important source of dust. Once you have a source and that's available to be uplifted uh, and wind that's strong enough to pick this dust up, it's picked up into the atmosphere where it has a lot of direct and indirect effects on Earth's climate. So, uh, you know, you can have the scattering of incoming solar radiation um, or the absorption of outgoing long wave radiation. And this is all really dependent on the size and the mineralogy, mineralogy of dust particles. So this is something that's really not super well constrained as we move um, throughout different latitudes on Earth's surface. So especially high latitude dust, you know, what the size distribution looks like, what the mineralogy looks like has an impact on uh, radiative, um, Earth's radiative balance. I talked a little bit already about the importance of dust deposition in marine ecosystems. So delivering important sources of iron and silica to the ocean surface, you have this exchange of CO2 happening. Um, you can have this net organic carbon export. If we wanted to look at dust variability on really, really long time scales, we turn to marine sediment core records, which give us these time scales of millions of years. Um, at Scripps right now, there's people who are working on the, the role of dust transport in terms of um, cloud formation processes. So atmospheric rivers, basically these narrow bands of precipitation that are reaching the western coast of the United States have been linked to dust plumes from Asian deserts. So it's this idea that if you have a dust particle that acts as a nucleus for a cloud, cond for cloud condens condensation, um, you can have of these kind of hydrological events linked to them. You have terrestrial fertilization. So eventually this dust makes its way to other continents. And um, a part of our research group is focused on passive dust collection. So monitoring dust transport and deposition on you know, long time scales throughout the course of um, several years, how it varies with respect to season, um, uh, tracking where this dust is coming from. And then we have this dust making its way up to higher latitudes. So um, you probably are already familiar with the idea of dust being deposited on snow and ice surfaces, lowering albedo, right? But in Antarctica, I, I'm really interested in looking at dust variability on glacial and interglacial time scales. So we use the ice core record to kind of probe these variations. Okay, so some of the big questions that uh, we have with our group is how does dust flux and also the sources of dust vary um, with respect to climate um, or geomorphology. So um, is dust transport on long time scales uh, largely driven by glacial and interglacial cycles um, or does this have to do with changes in Earth's surface? Obviously those two things are linked to one another um, but we're kind of exploring the nuances especially on shorter time scales as well. We have this big question of, you know, does dust actually have this significant fertilization um, that people have cited so frequently? So um, marine and terrestrial ecosystems, right? So um, does dust deposition actually have a significant impact on the global carbon cycle? And then the last question is related to how do we determine where this dust is coming from? So for, uh, I think, I don't know if I can get rid of this, oops. I think I paused my screen sharing. Is it still showing up there? Sorry. 
that's good. Resume here. Okay. All right. I'll just not use laser pointer right now. Okay. So we use isotopes as a way to fingerprint where our dust is coming from. And I'm showing you this map, and it's basically showing you the age um, of last thermotectonic events on, on Earth's surface. So you can see that each continent has a very different tectonic history. This means that they have a different geochemical composition, and this imparts a unique isotopic composition to different, um, different places on our surface. So the traditional provenance indicators for sediment are strontium and neodymium isotopes. So, uh, you know, we use strontium 87 um, ratios with respect to strontium 86, and then we also use neodymium 143 with respect to neodymium 144. Um, the variations in neodymium are really, really tiny. So they're in the fifth or sixth decimal place. And so for the rest of the talk, um, I'm going to be using epsilon notation, which is basically normalizing our isotope ratios to um, a standard, the chondritic uniform reservoir. So instead of these really tiny numbers, you're going to be seeing positive and, and negative integers. Um, and so what does this isotope fingerprint actually mean? Uh, just drag this uh, up here. Um, so here I'm showing a plot of strontium and neodymium isotope ratios of potential source areas of dust in the Southern hemisphere. So the idea here is that if I went to Antarctica and drilled an ice core and measured the dust composition during the last interglacial period, and it plotted somewhere within this source array, um, I would know with a particular level of certainty that this dust probably originated from the West Antarctic Rift System volcanic material. Um, some other major, major sources of dust to Antarctica, uh, is, you know, the Southern South America. So this whole region here is a huge source of dust, especially during glacial periods. Um, Australia has also been cited as a major source of dust and then also um, local areas in East Antarctica as well. So as you can see, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of our potential source areas of dust in Antarctica have quite a bit of overlap when we're looking at strontium and neodymium isotope ratios. Um, there's ways that we can kind of get around this. So employing additional isotope systems like lead, for example, or also measuring physical characteristics of the dust particles. So looking at mineralogy, looking at size distribution, this can also be used as uh, potential indicators of, of where the dust uh, may have originated from. Okay, so uh, I guess to kind of like pull it all together um, in terms of our modern uh, dust work, we're really interested in looking at natural versus anthropogenic driven dust flux. So I'm showing an image on the left and uh, you can see that it's a dust plume from Asia that's being carried across the Pacific Ocean. So we're constantly receiving dust from Asia, um, from Asian deserts, right? But the picture on the right is a picture of a trailer or a tractor basically plowing through a field in the Central Valley in California. So you can see here that human activity actually produces quite a bit of dust and sediment that gets uplifted. So how can we distinguish between the two? Um, I didn't even mention particulate matter from um, anthropogenic activity, but that's another thing that um, we think about a lot. Um, in terms of the uh, both modern and paleoclimate dust records that we're looking at, we think a lot about surface condition driven dust flux and composition. So the picture on the left is Gruink Glacier in Alaska. Um, it's, uh, I'm originally from Alaska, so this is a picture that was taken with a drone. Uh, and then the picture on the right is just a satellite image of the Sahara Desert. So very, very different environments. Right. One is basically governed by physical uh, weathering, physical erosion of sediment. Right, And the one on the right, this dust has been present on Earth's surface for thousands of years, exposed to oxygen, water. Uh, a lot of the iron within that material um, is most likely oxidized, and you can tell also from, from its color. Right, So when we're thinking about iron, which is like this huge thing that people who are interested in ocean fertilization think a lot about. Thinking about the speciation of the iron actually matters. So in a place where you have a lot of physical weathering, you would be governed by more reduced iron, whereas a place that's been exposed to oxygen for long periods of time, you would have more ox oxidized iron, which is obvious, right? 
Um, but this actually matters in terms of fertilization potential. So the reduced form of iron is more bioavailable, right, than the oxidized form of iron. So thinking about um, how the dust formed before its transport is, is important. All right, so I'm just gonna show you a few images. I know I said in the talk or the description of the talk that I was gonna uh, cover a modern kind of dust record, but I'm actually just gonna show you a little bit about what we do and, and not get too far into it. Um, but how do we actually collect dust in the field? So this is an early prototype. Uh, we don't actually do it like this anymore. And we're exploring new collection uh, methods, but uh, a project that started in the Sierra Nevada mountains in 2014, um, we were basically taking Teflon coated bunt cake pans, which you can clean with acid because they're Teflon coated and putting them up on two meter tall um, posts in open areas in the mountains. Um, and the idea here is that you had these marbles and dust that was settling out of the atmosphere would basically settle on top of the marbles and kind of sift through there. And the marbles would prevent dust um, from being remobilized if a gust of wind blew over, um, over the bunt cake pan. So we do this monitoring on long time scales. Uh, we have one project right now that's looking at, um, looking at dust deposition in the uh, San Jacinto Mountains in California. So here we're looking at two different mountain transects. So we're looking at the, the south side, which is less steep, and we're looking also at the north side here. Um, I'm working with a geomorphologist who's really interested in looking at climate versus tectonic controls on landscape evolution, but we're kind of covering the dust portion of it. And we have these questions about you know, dust flux and composition, right? So we know that dust flux varies uh, temporally. So we see it happening a lot over like annual time scales and throughout the course of a dry season. Um, but what about spatially? So um, this north transect is really close to uh, a lot of deserts uh, located nearby. Um, we actually have um, you know, Coachella Valley here, a lot of agricultural activity. We have the Salton Sea kind of southeast of this mountain transect. And then this uh, south side here, um, we anticipate is governed more by Asian dust deposition. Um, here, we're really looking at, you know, what about the nutrients that are within the dust that's deposited, right? Is this incorporated into vegetation? So I have one student who's basically trying to use isotopes as a way to track nutrient incorporation. Uh, and then how do we distinguish between natural and anthropogenic source dust? So we use isotopes, you know, strontium and neodymium can tell us where the dust is coming from, but other isotope systems um, like lead or even iron isotopes can actually tell us um, some information about if it's coming from um, combustion, for example. So I just have a time-lapse video showing um, some of the work that we're doing in the field. So we've upgraded our dust collection technique. Instead of having these passive dust collectors on these wooden poles, we actually have a climate monitoring station that's tracking things like ambient air temperature, soil temperature and humidity, um, yeah, among other variables. We also have a lot of work ongoing in um, high latitude dust. So um, here, you know, I have a picture of a recent postdoc who just started in our lab group, uh, Kiefer. So he's really interested in these questions related to glacial retreat um, and its impact on dust emissions. Um, in particular, he's kind of interested in looking at um, uh, sediment in small icebergs um, in Antarctica and also in South Central Alaska, right? So, he thinks a lot, he's, he's trained as a, um, as a chemical oceanographer. So he thinks a lot in terms of the fertilization potential um, of marine ecosystems, right? And so uh, we know that iron is an important source of nutrients for phytoplankton, but he's asking these um, really in-depth biological questions about how is the iron actually accessed from these, from these glaciogenic particles. So these, these particles that are coming from glaciers and ice sheets. Okay, so, now I'm going to start on the ice core record um, portion. And, uh, you know, I don't really focus that much on Greenland um, yet, but uh, most of my work has focused on Antarctica. And in particular, I work a lot on um, ice core records from the peripheral portion of the East Antarctic ice sheet. So basically uh, right down here. 
and I'm sure we're all familiar with ice cores, but you know, they're these very um, uh, pristine records of, of Earth's climate. So people have been using ice cores for, for decades to look at greenhouse gas composition. Um, they're our only direct measurement of what CO2 and methane uh, concentrations were like um, pre-industrial. Um, before that, we have to rely on proxy records. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in like the impurities that are preserved in the ice core record. So things like uh, sea salt um, and, and, and dust as well. So, uh, okay. So what does a dust record in a traditional ice core actually look like? So this is a uh, climate record from uh, the Dome C ice core in interior East Antarctica. And you may be already familiar with it, but this is our longest continuous ice core that we have to date. It goes back 800,000 years. And I'm showing the deuterium composition on top. Um, and then we have our dust concentration on bottom. And our ice core records show this really beautiful um, seesaw pattern of multiple glacial and interglacial cycles going back through time, right? And if we look at our dust record, we can see that our dust concentrations also have this seesaw pattern that goes back through time, um, but it's inversely related to temperature. So during our cold periods, we have our higher dust fluxes. And then during our warm periods, we have really, really low dust fluxes. There's a variety of reasons for this, um, hypothesized reasons. So number one, uh, people think that, um, you know, well, we know that sea level was lower during glacial periods, right? So we had a, a lot of ice sheets stored on land in the form, yeah, water stored on land in the form of ice sheets and glaciers. So we have more exposed sediments on continental shelves, so more dust available for transport. We also have a slower hydrological cycle. So you just have uh, less evaporation of seawater, uh, less uh, precipitation, so drier conditions. Also, the temperature gradient between the pole and the equator was higher, so you have gustier conditions potentially. So um, this is all, you know, you have wind, you have sediment availability, you have dryness. This is perfect combination for dusty conditions. Um, I'm gonna be focusing, I'm gonna be telling a short little story about this transition from marine isotope stage six. Um, so a glacial period and the transition into the last interglacial period, marine isotope stage five E. Um, and I'm gonna be telling you a, a story based on one that we developed from the Taylor Glacier. Um, we also developed a record from the transition from MIS two. So the last glacial period into the Holocene as well. Um, but here we're interested in how does dust transport and the sources of dust um, respond to variations in Earth's climate. So going from a glacial to an interglacial period. Uh, can we reconstruct environmental conditions from dust, from dust records? Um, this is a big question, right? Um, and then also um, on a longer time scale, we're more interested in the dust fertilization potential of, of, um, uh, within the ice core record. Okay. so. Taylor Glacier is located, um, it's an outlet glacier draining the East, uh, East Antarctic ice sheet. Um, you can see it right here, this little pink dot. Uh, it's located very close to this intersection between the East Antarctic ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Ross ice shelf, and the Southern Ocean. Um, so it's a really kind of dynamic area uh, in Antarctica. Here's a satellite image of Taylor Glacier right here. Um, yeah, I would put my po laser pointer on, but I don't want to <laughs> deal with any more problems. But you can see I'm kind of tracing it right here. It, it drains the East Antarctic ice sheet and it, it terminates on land. And uh, it's a really beautiful place to work, number one, because it has um, a really nice climate record preserved there, but it's also surrounded by mountains. So there's a lot of exposed rock nearby. Um, Another important thing about the Taylor Glacier is that it's located close to the West Antarctic ice sheet. And West Antarctica is this prominent volcanic region, right? And so um, this is a huge oversimplification, but it, it is located close to the West Antarctic rift system boundary. And so thinking about the underlying bedrock, the type of rocks, the geology, the geochemistry, um, that's something that we think a lot about as we're looking at the dust composition preserved in that ice core record. 
So if I was to really simplify the underlying geology beneath the ice, we can think of Taylor Glacier being underlain by this old crust characterized by very radiogenic strontium isotope compositions, and then West Antarctica as being underlain by young volcanic rock that has very low strontium isotope compositions. Um, this will become more important a little bit later when I show you some of the isotope data that we developed from this, from this ice core. Um, but you know, when I say that we developed this ice core record, we're not drilling traditional ice cores. We're not drilling into the ice sheet and getting like a two mile long ice core. We're actually using the flow of the, of the glacier to our advantage and in, in developing a horizontal ice core from the Taylor Glacier. So if we think about the way that the glacier flows, uh, I like to uh, use a deck of cards as an example of it. So if you think of a deck of cards and you push it like this, um, you have your old ice being exposed towards the toe of the glacier. And then as you move up towards the accumulation area, that's where you have your younger ice. So um, based on you know, uh, the flow dynamics and the speed of the glacier, we know that there's about a 200,000 year record preserved at Taylor Glacier. So our younger ice would be closer to the accumulation area, older ice closer to the toe. And then also when we're thinking across the glacier, we have our old ice on the margins of the glacier and then our young ice towards the center of the glacier. Um, some of you may be familiar with Taylor Glacier because it's known for blood falls. You can kind of see the, a little bit of it in this photo right here. So we know that there's a really good paleoclimate record preserved in this glacier because there's been a lot of previous work that's been done. So we're looking at this satellite image. Um, in the late 1990s, a core, an ice core was drilled at Taylor Dome. And this record went back uh, uh, about 145,000 years. Um, and, um, and so my previous advisor, my PhD advisor, went to Taylor Glacier during her PhD. And she basically went along the surface of the Taylor Glacier and collected subsurface ice samples and measured uh, the deuterium composition of that ice. And she compared it to the Taylor Dome ice core. And what she found was that the two paleoclimate records were very comparable to one another. So basically, she went about 30 kilometers along the surface of this glacier on a snow machine, um, taking little subsurface ice samples um, and developed this horizontal ice core record. And this was really exciting because it kind of um, showed that you can use a glacier as a horizontal ice core. So when we think about ice, um, traditional ice cores, we get these cores that are pretty small. So we're sample, sample limited. Right? And a lot of the work that people are kind of pushing forward in terms of isotope measurements of greenhouse gases or uh, isotope measurements of dust, for example, these are all super trace amounts in the ice. And so if we were able to get horizontal ice cores, we can actually get much larger ice core pieces to kind of make these measurements that weren't previously possible. Um, it's a blue ice area. And uh, you know, what is a blue ice area? So this is a place where the net, net snow ablation, um, it has, uh, uh, it's an area with net snow ablation. So uh, uh, as opposed to snow accumulation, uh, the, the ice is blue, right? So the name sticks, um, it appears blue from the air uh, because there's not usually a lot of snow or fern cover. Um, and so I'm showing kind of a schematic from the Allen Hills, which is part of the Coldex project right now. And the Allen Hills is a unique place because it's basically where you've had topography that's blocking the ice flow. So you have ice that's basically draining the East Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, you have this blocking and um, you have this surfacing of old ice. Um, and so this whole section here is this blue ice and the Allen Hills is really well known in the ice core community because this is the place where people have been finding uh, one, two, two and a half million year old ice. So this is oldest ice that we've ever been able to find in Antarctica um, um, to look at greenhouse gas compositions and also dust. Okay. And you know, maybe you might be wondering like, why don't I use an ice core record from the interior portion 
of Antarctica. So this is a map that's showing all major existing Antarctic ice core locations. So we've been drilling, uh, the ice core community in general has been drilling a ton of ice cores, right? And most of them are focused in the interior portion of the East Antarctic ice sheet. Um, but there's a few that are located closer to the coast. Um, and, you know, I like ice margins for a number of reasons. Um, uh, the first reason is because the dust flux is typically higher. So this is a figure from um, a paper published by Bess Kaufman, and it's basically showing the relationship between dust flux and elevation on the ice sheet. And you can see that as you move towards outside edges of an ice sheet, you get higher dust flux. And um, so this is a variety of reasons. Uh, one being that you know when you're closer to places where you have exposed sediment, for example, you're probably going to be getting more dust input from those locations. So I like peripheral ice core records because they can give you a more nuanced kind of view of what's happening along the edges of the ice sheet, rather than the interior ice core records, which are giving you more of a global or hemispheric view of what's happening. All right, and then one more reason why I'm kind of plugging these uh, horizontal ice cores or these blue ice areas is that, again, it's just due to sample limitation. So this is kind of a cutting diagram of how we would split up a traditional ice core. So a lot of it is, is dedicated to gases. And if we're lucky, we might get a section about this big to do our isotope measurements. And so it's super tiny and it's easy to make isotope measurements of dust on glacial samples because we have such high amounts of dust in there. But during interglacial periods, when the, when the flux is so low, uh, we have to combine meters and meters of ice in order to get one data point. And so before these horizontal ice cores, we basically had these uh, really long time average records of what interglacial dust composition looked like. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you some photos from the field at Taylor Glacier, um, where I did the bulk of uh, my PhD work. So we use this blue ice drill, um, which we'll also use in the Allen Hills as well. And it's a drill that's uh, specifically designed to get high volume ice core samples. So um, this is what they look like when they're taken out. Um, each one of them weighs over 100 pounds. Um, and um, they're a little bit unwieldy to work with. Um, yeah, so you kind of have to, you know, balance bagging ice in the field while you're walking on ice, putting it into a box. We transported our ice back to our labs where we do cutting and decontamination um, for, for our dust uh, measurements. So what does this actually look like? You know, we do a lot of clean lab chemistry in our group. So, the ice core drill itself has metal, right? So we bring it into the lab and we scrape the outside of it to try to get any contamination off. Um, you can actually see a little layer of dust in this ice core piece right here. Um, we then uh, melt and filter our ice. So here's kind of, you know, a really kind of put together. <laughs> it's not always pretty what we do in the lab, but, um, you know, we we melt and filter ice, and then we collect it on a filter, on a Teflon filter like this. And so we can digest or dissolve our dust directly off the filter. And we use column chemistry to basically separate out the isotope, the elements that we're interested in measuring. Um, okay, so now to talk a little bit more about this record from marine isotope stage six to five E. So this transition between this cold to this warm period. Um, you know, why would we care about MIS-5E? Well, um, you know, people often think of it as this like analog for a warmer climate, right? Uh, obviously the orbital conditions were very different to today, but we know that it was warmer, right? Estimates are up to three degrees Celsius warmer. We think that sea level was higher. So there's this kind of uh, range of sea level estimates um, from about five and a half to nine meters. Um, where did this rise in sea level come from? So which ice sheets melted uh, that contributed to this rise in sea level? You collapse the Greenland ice sheet and you add you know, mountain glaciers, ice caps, and account for ocean thermal expansion. This is about between two and four meters of sea level. If you collapsed the West Antarctic ice sheet, it would add potentially about three meters of sea level. So, um, you know, we know that the West Antarctic ice sheet has 
uh, collapsed some time in the past, and the timing of this is relatively unclear. And so, you know, is this dust record from this last interglacial period going to be able to tell us anything about ice sheet stability? It seems a little far fetched, but you know, maybe by the end of the talk, um, I'll have convinced you that it's potentially possible. All right. So this is the record that we developed spanning MIS 6 to 5E. Um, the Taylor Glacier record is shown in blue. This is the oxygen isotope composition of the precipitate or the water portion. Uh, we created a preliminary age scale. Um, we know the age of the ice because Christo Bowser dated it with Krypton 81 and he got an age of about 125,000 years. So we know that it goes into the last interglacial period. We think we successfully captured this transition um, from MIS-6 into 5E. Um, I'm showing cerium and non-sea salt sulfur. Um, I won't really talk about those. I mostly want to focus on the isotopes of the dust that we measured. So we have strontium isotopes right here, and we have neodymium isotopes right here. So when we're looking at the composition, um, we only got one sample from MIS-6, right? Um, but we did capture this transition into the last interglacial period. And the main thing that you can note in the two different isotopes is that uh, it looks different during the interglacial period compared to the glacial period, right? So our dust composition is different, which makes sense. It's like, we don't always expect the sources of dust to Antarctica to be the same during cold periods as they are during warm periods. But where is this dust actually coming from, right? So back to this simplified map where I'm showing old crust with this radiogenic or high strontium isotope composition and this volcanic West Antarctic Rift System material with this low strontium isotope composition. Okay, so this is um, comparing the two different transitions to each other. And it's a little bit of a complicated, um, uh, plot, but I kind of want to, I'll walk you through it. So we're looking at the Taylor Glacier record, um, and we're looking at the transition from the last glacial maximum, last glacial period uh, up here. All the blue symbols are from that record and the transition into the Holocene right here. We're also looking at the dust record from uh, marine isotope stage six. So right here, and the transition into the last interglacial period. I've colored coded the background of this one to basically indicate um, whether it was a cold, so blue uh, glacial regime or a warm interglacial period. Um, these gray bands right here are showing you the potential, the average potential source areas of dust composition. So East Antarctica has a composition uh, around 0.712 or so. South America is about 0.709. And then our West Antarctic Rift System volcanics are actually plotting off scale down here. But I've included this little cheat thing here. So you can think of old crust or sediment um, being characterized up here and then younger volcanic sediment down here. So when we're looking at our glacial samples, we're looking at this MIS six to the last glacial period composition. And uh, unsurprisingly, they look similar to each other. We expected this glacial samples in other ice core records look like other glacial samples. It's mostly coming from South America. But then when we looked at the comparison between the Holocene, which are, are all these blue symbols right here, and the last interglacial period, which are these red symbols down here, we actually saw quite a bit of difference, right? So there was a divergence in the isotope composition, meaning that the dust sources were different. So during the Holocene, we had this mixture of input from Southern South America. We always have dust coming from Southern South America, but we also saw a high amount of dust coming from East Antarctica. But during the last interglacial period, we had this really, really volcanic dust composition, which we were very surprised by. And this is kind of sustained over a six or 7,000 year period. So it wasn't like a discrete event that we're looking at. We're actually looking at quite a bit of volcanic material sustained over a long period of time. Uh, we also see it in the neodymium isotope composition. So our isotopes are telling us that the dust composition during the last interglacial period was young and volcanic. And so the question is, is like, what is the source of this volcanic dust or sediment? 
where is it coming from? Keep having to move these around. All right, so thinking about how dust is transported um, is a great place to start. So number one, we think about sediment exposure or sediment availability. So what does it look like when you melt an ice sheet or a glacier? Right? You basically end up with a situation like this where your glacier is gone, but it's left behind a lot of sediment that's available to be transported, right? So this question of, did we have an increased exposure of volcanic material following a deglaciation? It's a, it's a good place to think or start, start thinking about. There's also this idea of heightened volcanism. So um, this has been proposed before it's that, you know, when you have ice maximum conditions, ice sheets are extremely heavy, right? And so uh, you have this, this compressive st stress that's basically stalling magma. Um, and then there's this idea that if you had a rapid unloading, so a rapid melting of an ice sheet, right, you are releasing this stress and that volcanism um, or rates of volcanism can increase during interglacial periods um, after this after this release of stress. So this is one thing that we looked into. However, we didn't see discrete volcanic events in our ice core record. And so we don't think that this is um, the, the primary source of the volcanic dust composition. And then finally, we have to think about wind transport, right? So atmospheric dynamics is a huge part of the picture. Um, this is a figure from a paper published by Eric Steig in 2015. And here he was basically using um, uh, uh, model simulations to look at what would happen with Antarctic temperature and also surface wind conditions if you melted the West Antarctic ice sheet. So I'm showing you four different climate simulations here, right? And you can see that, you know, removing the West Antarctic ice sheet is unsurprisingly going to have a huge effect on Antarctic temperature, right? But it also has an effect on surface wind conditions. So right now, when we think about Antarctica, we think about most of the surface wind coming from the East Antarctic plateau and flowing outwards from there. But if you removed an ice sheet, uh, like West Antarctic ice sheet, right? You could potentially reverse surface wind conditions um, or perturb them in a way that you're transporting material to a site that wouldn't necessarily um, happen previously. So, you know, that whole project, like, you know, we never really came to a direct answer, right? So, you know, when I was trying to get this paper through review and published, you know, I had a lot of comments from reviewers, like, you should do some climate simulations and simulate the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and, and monitor how that would affect dust transport. And I thought to myself, that's a really good idea, um, but I'm not a climate modeler. And, um, but it, you know, it's, it's a really good idea. And so it was actually one of the first proposals that I wrote as a new PI at Scripps um, was to kind of explore this dust, this volcanic dust composition during the last interglacial period in more detail. So that project, the MIS 6 to 5E was like the kind of last end project of my PhD it actually wasn't included in my, my dissertation. But, you know, we were still, you know, I came up with these ideas, but we didn't quite pinpoint the exact source of the volcanic dust composition during the last interglacial. So, um, We wrote a proposal um, and position at the Allen Hills during the last interglacial period. And the questions that we're asking um, are, you know, what's the underlying cause of this volcanic dust signature during the last interglacial? So do we see it at the Allen Hills in addition to Taylor Glacier? Uh, we're gonna be employing lead isotopes in addition to strontium and neodymium um, because this can help us pinpoint exactly which volcano it could have come from. Uh, we're also doing things like um, detailed SEM imaging. So um, this can give us some more context as to whether the dust came from a fresh volcanic eruption or if it's reworked sediment that was previously covered by an ice sheet or glacier. And I'm partnering with a climate modeler who is basically going to be doing some GCM simulations of different last interglacial ice sheet extents. So large, medium, and small uh, to test the sensitivity of dust transport to changes in ice sheet extent. So can we even tell 
changes in ice sheet extent from the dust record? It's a big question. Okay, and then um, a little bit more about the, the future work with the Allen Hills ice. So I, at the very beginning of the talk, I brought up iron and um, you know iron speciation as being a really important thing to, to look at. And I'm showing a figure from a paper published by Elizabeth Schoenfeld in 2018. And she developed a record of dust um, in a marine sediment core from the Southern Ocean um, going back about 100,000 years. And um, you can see how the dust flux varies with respect to uh, glacial and interglacial periods. Um, but she actually looked at the speciation of the dust um, during cold and warm periods. And what she found was that during warm periods, you had a higher proportion, uh, or a, sorry, a lower proportion of reduced iron with respect to the total iron content in the dust. And during the glacial periods, you had a higher proportion of reduced iron. So more bioavailable iron during these cold periods. And so thinking about the, the process that formed that dust and also uh, how this dust composition varies um, based on the climate regime is something that we're, we're looking into. So how does iron flux and the speciation vary further back in time? Um, and we're gonna be applying this to ice from the mid Pleistocene transition. And so this is a period of time about uh, 1.25 million years ago um, where Earth's glacial and interglacial cycles changed from about 40,000 year periodicity to 100,000 year periodicity. And we also had intensifying glacial periods. Right? And so I'm showing a record developed by Martinez Garcia from another marine sediment core record and um, intriguingly, the dust record is shown down here in red, um, red and black. So we have low dust fluxes prior to this period. And then uh, we have an increasing dust flux and also iron supply um, from dust that coincides with the mid Pleistocene transition. So we're gonna be looking at the dust in the ice core record. Uh, we're gonna be looking at how did the change in iron supply through the dust um, affect these ice ages. Um, and it's really nice because we're working with a collaborative group of people who also work on greenhouse gas compositions. So we'll be able to develop these records of um, dust and iron speciation alongside records of CO2 con concentration. Um, so really being able to probe how these two variables um, are related to one another in the ice core record. Um, so they, yeah, that's all that I had for today. And I'd just like to thank everyone for their attention and happy to take any questions. Well, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, we'll, I think we'll start in the room if there are any questions. Um, I have a quick question related to that last. Um, so how much of the marine ecosystems essentially in debt to the glacial glaciations that we're currently in uh you mean like how much can we attribute to the, the dust um supplying the ocean basically with nutrients? yeah that's a really good question so, so uh like basically trying to figure out how much co2 would alter or change if you had this uh iron fertilization right right yeah so mostly people have done these simulations just based on dust flux and you assume that there's this linear relationship between dust flux and CO2. Um, but what we're, you know, I, I didn't show another figure from, well, there's another paper published by Elizabeth Schoenfeld um, that actually looks at uh, chlorophyll production rates and also um, reproduction rates of, of um, diatoms and phytoplankton, for example. So what people are finding is that, uh, you know, the chemical composition of the dust rather than just the dust flux actually has a larger impact on CO2 drawdown. So um, I guess the long answer to your question is we're not sure now because we think that there's a lot of variability depending on how much iron and the speciation or bioavailability of that iron. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, any other questions in the room? That was a great talk. Uh, I've got kind of a weird question. Um, so I've been looking into sea ice and I know that the cycles of melting are kind of important for uh, basically fertilizing, I think the marine environment with iron. 
Uh, and I'm kind of curious, like, how does that compare to the role of dust fertilization? Um, and kind of where like my brain is thinking with this is if we do have kind of a reduction in the extent of sea ice, is this something that dust might play more of an important role in, in terms of fertilizing those environments? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I'm a little bit more familiar with the iceberg portion rather than sea ice. And um, I mean, what kefir, okay, so like the idea with dust is that, um, you know, you would potentially have like a further reach out away from the margins of a continent, right? So um, in places where you would, um, where you're iron limited, where you don't necessarily get this iron that's basically being um, constantly supplied by rivers or, you know, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, yeah, and I'm not sure exactly, I haven't kept up super up to date with like the literature about sea ice in particular, um, but you know, what we're, what Kiefer is finding is that um, the type of like where the iceberg is coming from like whether it's basal ice that's really heavily laden with sediments versus surface ice, obviously it matters a lot. Um, and he's also looking into the dissolved portion too. So um, like the colloidal portion of, of the ice. So rather than just looking at sediment, but also looking at like smaller, smaller particles, um, smaller than like 0.2 micron, for example. Um, yeah, but I, and I don't know exactly like how much, you know, sea ice would have an effect on that, but it's a, yeah, it's an interesting question. Thank you. I think we have a question from Gita online. Yes, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, so thanks for the really great talk. Um, you mentioned towards the end here, this recent work showing that there's more bioavailable iron during cold periods compared to warm periods. And I'm curious if that implies sort of an overall regime change in the net composition of global dust or whether this is really just a localized effect. Um, because if it implies a, a change in sort of net composition of global dust, you could imagine a related regime change in the radiative effects of the dust and consequently their, the dust climate forcing. And so I'm curious if that's kind of a track that anybody has followed and looked at in more detail. Yeah, that's a great question. So. As far as I'm aware, nobody has developed a record of glacial and interglacial variations in iron speciation, for example, in the northern hemisphere. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it does tell you a little bit like, you know, Elizabeth's paper, she has another one published in 2019, where she talks about the difference between physical versus chemical um, weathering derived dust and what that means for uh, nutrient bioavailability, things like that. Um, so I guess nobody really knows if it's a globally happening thing, but we're pretty confident that this is happening in the Southern hemisphere, especially with respect to the Southern ocean. Um, yeah, and you know, when we're looking at the differences between dust um, in terms of size on glacial and interglacial time scales, the dust is smaller during glacial periods, um, and it tends to be uh, dominated by more primary minerals. And so I would assume that this would have an effect on radiative balance um, based on what I understand about um, you know, dust and, and radiative properties. So yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know if anyone's pursuing this currently, but that's a great, great thought. Now we have a question from Ian Dial online. Are you hearing me? Yes. I wondered, since you're finding some, so much dust from South America, I wondered whether you had identified any from the South Sandwich Islands volcanic arc. The South Sandwich Islands? Yes. I haven't found any papers that, or at least I'm not super familiar with any papers that look at dust composition from that area. But if you ha if you know of any, um, please send them my way. <laughs> I will do. I think there's been some recent work there that may identify the composition better than it's been known before. I'll okay. If I find them, I will send them to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. <laughs>
Am I still on? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions in the room? I guess I got. Oh, here we go. Um, I was wondering if you could, like, maybe the quantities are too small, but sort of tell the size of the desert that, like, if there's been a lot of increasing desertification in, like, a specific time in the past, whether that would be reflected in the core or if it's. Sorry, if, uh, if we can detect, like, increasing desertification? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in, like, in the Southern Hemisphere or, yeah. So, I mean, I think, uh, the majority of the dust flux is governed by, um, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, by the atmospheric dynamics. So people think that it's mostly related to wind. Um, but there's also been some really interesting papers that talk about the downstream environments of, of South American glaciers as like being a huge source of, uh, or a huge like underlying cause of whether we have high or low dust flux. And so um, during periods or places where you have dust being deposited on like outwash plains in South America, um, because most of this dust is glaciogenic, it's coming from glaciers. When it's deposited on these like broad outwash plains, it's a lot easier for that dust to be mobilized um, rather than periods of time where we had uh, glacial discharge into like a lake, for example. So um, yeah, that's kind of, I brought up briefly like the, the role of geomorphology in dust transport. And so like in South America, that's one thing that people think a lot about, about a lot. Um, in the Holocene record that I developed for the, yeah, for the Taylor Glacier, we did see some influence of Australian dust sources. Um, and there's been a, other, a few other papers published um, looking at like peripheral ice cores in Antarctica that have uh, attributed dust composition to Australia. And so people do think that this is related to er er eridification, uh, human activity potentially, um, but it's kind of hard to pinpoint right now. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Um, I guess. Oh. Uh, yeah, I have a question about like the modern sort of dust work that you were doing. How specific can you get with like provenance of dust? Is it just continental scale or can you kind of tell even more specifically where it comes from? Yeah, that's a great question. I was going to show data, but I, I didn't want to. I felt like I would rush through both if I tried to show both stories. But with the Sierra Nevada dust uh, story, um, basically we started that project during that drought in, in California in 2014. And the big question there was like, how would the drought in California impact um, uh, dust supply and then also the, the dust sources? And uh, what we found was that um, we had this, we went to the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory and we set up four different collectors along the transect. And uh, the lowest elevation one was really close to the Central Valley. And then we had a high elevation one um, in like high alpine environment. All of the collectors are constantly receiving dust from Asia. Um, but throughout the course of the drought, we actually saw an increasing input of Central Valley dust happening. And so there's always a mixture, right? You're mixing dust. And so you can try to parse out like you know, the proportion of dust that's coming from Asia compared to the Central Valley, for example. Um, and this can kind of be informed by um, dust transport modeling, um, back trajectory analysis, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, you know, modern dust transport, it's, it's a little bit more, um, especially at like, you know, the San Jacinto Peak or the Sierra Nevada, it's, it's a little bit more difficult compared to places like Antarctica, where the known sources of dust are pretty well established, um, except during interglacial periods, which is kind of like, yeah, what we're finding here. So does that answer that question? Yeah, so it's kind of like almost meteorological, like detective work to kind of back yeah, where it comes to, from. To figure out like, you know, 
uh, for the San Jacinto project, we have ideas of where this dust would be coming from. We have an idea that you know, all, we're going to have some Asian dust um, present. We also think that um, you know the Santa Ana winds are basically like transporting dust from like the deserts um, in the opposite direction of the predominant wind direction. Um, and there was a paper published recently in um, QSR, I think like a year ago, that basically it was a marine sediment core off the coast of um, California, kind of near the Channel Islands. And like people, I think they were in, you know, expecting to see a lot of dust coming from Asia, but what they're actually, what they showed was that you had a, a huge proportion of dust coming from the Santa Ana winds, for example. So uh, uh, Southwest dust sources are actually um, making its way into the Pacific Ocean. Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks. Well, yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, a great presentation and a great series of questions. Um, everybody, I think, virtually or otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for and all the questions. And there's a couple yeah. of slots, I think, left this afternoon and uh, also for, for dinner as well, if anybody's interested, just let me know. Yeah, thank you. Really great question. <laughs>